Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, make us worthy to celebrate the exaltation of your glorious cross with sacred hymns and with psalms. When you appear on the last day, and the sign of your cross shall shine brighter than the sun, Gather us before you and surround us with your eternal light, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. <clears throat> Peace be with the church and your children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Savior who made the wood of his cross, a strong fortress for his flock, and established it as a sign of the covenant for the salvation of his inheritance. By his cross he exalted his church and gave joy to all people who have believed in it. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives, now and forever. Amen. O Christ our God, by your precious cross you have given us perfect salvation and made us worthy to celebrate this feast with hymns of praise proclaiming. Blessed are you, O wood of the Holy Cross, for you have erased Adam's curse and restored his banished children to their inheritance. Blessed are you, O Holy Cross, for you have united heavenly and earthly beings. Blessed are you, O Holy Cross, for you fulfilled the words of the prophets. Enlighten the apostles in their preaching, crown the martyrs for their faith, and honor the confessors for their loyalty. Now, O Christ, our Savior, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to make the celebration of the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross a sign of security and peace. By your cross, exalt your holy church, guide her shepherds, adorn her priests with virtue, purify her deacons, help the elderly, educate children, direct the young, 
Protect orphans, care for widows, and grant rest in your dwellings of light to our brothers and sisters who have died hoping in you. May we find refuge in the shadow of your cross on the great day of your second coming, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, forever. Jesus Christ, our Lord, accept these prayers and the fragrance of the incense that we have offered on the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross. May its sign always be visible before our eyes to strengthen us, that we may walk with you toward death and then stand at your right hand to celebrate the feast of your eternal victory. We glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Kaddishat, aloha kaddishat, Oh, 
purify our minds and purify our consciences, that we may praise you with purity and listen to your holy scriptures. To you be glory forever. With the sign of your cross, Lord, you ordain your holy priests, and they give us the mysteries through the power of your cross. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the learning of the learned I shall set aside. Where is the wise one? Where is the scribe? Where is the, the debater of this age? Has not God made the wisdom of this world foolishness? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not come to know God through wisdom, it was the will of God through the foolishness of the proclamation to save those who have faith. For the Jews demand signs, and the Greeks look for wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both the Jews and Greeks alike, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God, it is stronger than the strength of men. Praise be to God always. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The message of the cross is foolishness to the Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. 
From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Apostle John writes, Now there were some Greeks among those who had come up to worship at the feast, and they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. And they asked him, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. So Philip went and he told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and they told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Amen, amen, I say to you. Unless the grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world shall preserve it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there also shall my servant be. And the Father will honor whoever serves me. I am troubled now, yet what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But it was for this, pers this purpose that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I shall glorify it again. The crowd there heard this and said that it was thunder. But others said, an angel has spoken to him. When Jesus said to them in reply, this voice did not come for my sake, but for yours. Now is the time of the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world shall be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I shall draw all things to myself. This is the truth, peace be with you. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In the Garden of Eden, the tree of life, which actually when you read it doesn't figure much in the story except being closed off at the end of the episode with Adam and Eve. The tree of life considered in the Syriac tradition is actually a type. It's a prophecy of the tree of life, of, of the cross of salvation. So throughout the Old Testament, you have people and events and things that in, we, the terminology we use is to call them types, meaning they're a foreshadowing of the truths and the realities to come in the future. And in this instance, the tree of life, which is there in the garden in paradise in Aden, it has its existence, but of course Adam and Eve have nothing to do with it, and only except for the fact that it's going to be surrounded by a sword of fire. When Saint Ephraim writes in his poetry, he talks about the wood of the cross being the sword that breaks that sword of fire of paradise allowing the true tree of life to bring forth salvation. 
And the tree of life, of course, is the cross of Calvary. The wood is the ability to shatter and to break. And some of these symbolisms and imageries we need to talk maybe even next week also. Because in the Syriac tradition, this is a whole new liturgical season. Between now and the end of October, the season of the exaltation of the Holy Cross is not just a feast day, and even in the Latin church, they have it on the 14th of September, but it's just a feast day. For us, it initiates an entire season which deals with our Lord being lifted up. When I am lifted up, I shall draw all things to myself, he says in the gospel. Again, it's an ambiguity. It's not everybody, every person, every human being. He says, all things will be drawn to me. Because in the Syriac vision, taking from that gospel, that vision that is translated to us in the apostolic faith, the redemption of the world is that it's cosmic. The entire world, the entire creation is affected by the choices of Adam and Eve. And so by the, our Lord embracing that fundamental wound of creation, death, he turns death on its head and the same way that creation is wounded. And creation is what is meant by paradise, talking about the garden. Paradisos in the Greek just means garden. It's coming from a Persian word. And the city that's now in Persia, in Iran, called Pasargarde. Pasargarde is the place of the tomb of the great emperor of Cyrus, the Shah and Shah, the king of kings of, of, of ancient Persia in the sixth century. He is the one who allows the Jews to go back out of captivity, back to their homelands. But Cyrus, when he dies, they build a tomb for him, and around his tomb, they build these irrigated gardens. And apparently, they were stunningly beautiful. And these irrigated gardens and rows and flowering trees and fruit trees and everything that was around it was so renowned internationally that the name of that place, Pasargarde, became the word for garden, period, paradisos, which then from the Greek gives you the word paradise which normally for most people means sitting around naked, eating fruit and doing whatever you want, which is not what paradise at all is. It just means an ordered, harmonious garden, even historically, that's its meaning. And so that's a historical connection. But the, in the paradise, in the garden, it's referring to the whole world, all of creation, not just a place geographically. You get all these people get all worked up. Where was the garden? Where was the garden? We're going to find it archaeologically. It's not a, obviously it's a place. These people live somewhere. But it's not a place in the sense that there was a fence and outside of it was a mess and this was the really nice gated community. That is not Genesis. The garden, the paradisos, the harmony of creation is what is represented by paradise. And so when they're expelled from the garden, it is in its poetry telling you the woundedness that creation is not the harmonious thing that it was first created to be. And that's when the, the tree of life comes in, it's in this garden, that's in the place of creation. We're told that it's then guarded by this flaming sword and this angel around it, meaning that life is not open to them until the day that it is opened by the rending of the veil, as St. Paul says, by our Lord, by the word who incarnates death upon the cross on Calvary thousands of years later. That's its imagery. So the Syriac tradition focuses upon the cross enormously. You can Google and find the Church of St. Clement, San Clemente in Rome. And it has a magnificent mosaic in which you have, it's one of the earliest representations of the cross with the body of our Lord crucified on it. But coming from the bottom of it, what the artist has done, it's over the, what's called the apse, the rounded part over the altar. So the altar is here, the back wall rounds around, and this kind of, not a dome, but this bent area around this whole apse is where the mosaic is at. And it's all done, it's really quite exquisite, done in blue stone. But the cross that is there, from its bottom, it has vines growing and there are tendrils coming out and they weave all around this mosaic. And in the mosaic, there are medallions of saints and different symbols and that around. 
Because what the artist has done to show you that the tree of life that's only foreshadowed at the beginning of humanity finds its reality in the death of our Lord upon the cross. It's why we have the ceremony today that we will carry this cross in procession. Normally you'd go outside or you'd be inside the church and do three times around, but obviously it's the apocalypse, so we try to make the least amount of movement that we can. So we'll do a mini one up the side and down the middle. Then because of this notion that life comes forth because of the cross, there will be a blessing in the ceremony to the four cardinal points to the east, and yes, I know geographically this is actually west, but it's just the way they had to build the church. But it is first to the east liturgically, to the west, to the north, and to the south, because the center of existence is that tree of life, which is foreshadowed in the old in Genesis, and in its reality in the cross itself. So the four corners of creation are blessed by it, then there's a blessing of holy water. And then they will sprinkle through it, reminding us of our baptism. And then you can take the holy water if you like after. We'll leave this out for a couple weeks. Now, normally at the end of this ceremony, there's a prayer that closes it. And we'll do this after the, after the sermon, well, after the, the collection part, but uh, when we, before we begin the offertory. Normally, everyone then comes up, and the, all, and the cross is here, and everyone comes up, makes a profound bow, like going to communion, and then kiss the cross. Now, we do this twice. We do this on Good Friday, and we do this on the exaltation of the cross. Exaltation of the cross normally has no figure on it, but I was lucky to find this iconographic cross. What you want is normally what they call the crux gemata, the jeweled cross. So again, in the early Middle Ages, you have a lot of these crosses that were made, they just have stones in them. They're highly ornate, but there's no body on them because they're representing the cross as being the living reality that brings life into the world. It's why, for those of you who know the older Latin traditions during Passion Time, all the statues get covered in purple. The crosses get covered in purple. And people always scratch their heads and they're going, well, why? Why if during the Passion time, why are we covering the crucifix? We can't even look upon our Lord. And then they scratch their head and then we do it again next year. Well, the reason why that is done is because historically, that tradition started way back in the Roman church in the early Middle Ages in which the crosses that were in the churches were crux gemata. They were crosses that had stones on them, they'd be in gold, or they may be in wood and be highly painted and decorated, but there's no body on them because they represent eternal life, they represent the victory of our Lord. And it's because they were so exquisitely beautiful in many cases, the idea, the idea was during the time of the Passion, we will cover them with dark cloth and focus upon our Lord's death and not just having this really kind of glorious cross. So what I had to do a few years ago was to find a cross have it made, but have one, I kept trying to find something that would be large enough to carry of a crux gemata, which became impossible. So the closest I came was to have our Lord as Christ the King in divine glory upon the cross. It's also why your banner has this image of our Lord. And you'll notice it's from the creed we have in its Syriac version. And he shall come again in his glory to judge the living and the dead. And so we have these verses on it because this whole season is also about the end of the world in which life will radiate out fully and perfectly in our Lord's appearance. That appearance is what ends time. It's not the ending of time and then Jesus shows up. It's because our Lord manifests himself in the parousia, which means appearance, that time will end and the dead will rise. So the Gospels are going to be throughout that whole notion of the cross and the day of judgment, the end of the world, until we reach the end of October. And then we start a whole other liturgical season once again on November 1st. So that's the overall view. And what I want to leave you with is that if you understand those different details of it, in the Syriac tradition, in the old, what we used to call Jewish Christianity, the earliest Aramaic versions that we have any kind of records of, 
For them, the cross is alive. It's living. And the Syriac writers, these Aramaic writers in the early, earliest centuries, talk about the cross entering with our Lord into the tomb. If you're here on Good Friday, we actually place all of that into the tomb that we have in that side alcove. The cross enters with our Lord, with the Messiah, into the tomb and enters with the Messiah into Sheol, into the place of death. So that the cross itself is always identified with Christ. And it is living, it is light-giving, it is luminous. And so it's portrayed also not only in descending into the tomb, descending into the place of the dead and shattering death on that Saturday of our Lord's death, but also rises with him with glory. And this is why when our Lord speaks, he says, talks about the signs of his coming. And he gives us one of the marks that the sign of the Son of Man shall be seen by all the nations of the earth. It will appear in the skies and the heavens. And of course, everyone interprets that as being the cross. But of course, it's even more explicit in the Syriac tradition because it is that living reality that will manifest itself. A few days ago, we had, we had a gentleman who was here and he'd come in after the mass. And we were talking for a while. And we had just put these banners up, just started changing everything to red for the season. So we started talking about the end of the world, as one does, right? And as we were in, we were in the chapel here, in the church here talking, and of course, there are way too many stupid things on television, YouTube, movies about, you know, they use these terms, they call these things angels, or it's Lucifer, or what, it's, it's all stupid. You waste your time. And very bizarre, it's like, how, where is this even coming from? And of course, one of them is the idea that Jesus' return is going to be like some man's going to show up someday and be found in, I don't know, New Delhi. And that's going to be the Christ. It's like, no, 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 no. That's the first time he comes, it's a baby in Bethlehem. You locate him by prophecies. When he makes his parousia, his appearance, that's why it's less good to call it the second coming, because it's just that the moment that Christ is present to us here and now will be manifested in its full glory. That's the parousia, he makes his appearance. That day, everyone's going to see it. And our Lord, in fact, says that the nations of the earth, he says, withering from fear in expectation and horror of the things that are to take place. That is the parousia. We'll talk about that more over these weeks to come. I just wanted to leave you with the, the understanding that in the Syriac tradition, this is a very profound season and that the cross is not just simply a symbol. What takes place in the Middle Ages having spoken about Passion Week and all that, covering in purple. It's that during the Middle Ages when you start making the cross no longer being the living symbol and the living reality of the tree of life, and the cross starts becoming a memorial of our Lord's death. That's when the corpus begins to appear. The body is on the cross. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that it becomes a different symbol at that point. But for well over the first thousand years of the church, the cross was the living, luminous, life-giving, victorious. Note the number of adjectives throughout the anaphoras as you go through them, referring to the cross, and the cross being living, vital, life-giving, luminous, victorious, divine. All this symbolism is from a very, very ancient and very early beginning of the church. And so to finish with St. Paul in this reading that was chosen in the first letter to the Corinthians, he says that the cross on a human level is a really dumb idea. Let's bring the God of glory and make him a condemned criminal on a rock outside of Jerusalem. If you think about it, right? If you're used to the faith, as he says, for those who are being saved, it's wisdom and glory. This is stupendous. But this whole text of St. Paul, he makes it clear. From a human perspective, dumb, really a dumb idea. I was one of those nerds that used to play Dungeons and Dragons. Those computer geeks, all my, all my friends now have PhDs in chemistry and stuff like that. 
that's just the kind of people they were, right? We all knew them, that was that group, right? So, and you used to have, it was very bizarre because even in the 70s as everything was really beginning to unravel, you had a very stupid entry into one of the monster manuals and all the books that all the geeks had all with their funny-sided dice and everything. And they have a whole book full of deities. And there was always one that all of these high school nerds would make fun of. Well, these high school nerds are the ones who are generating this multi-billion dollar industry now because they're all middle-aged bald men with disposable income. So they're still playing games, it's just on computers, so. But in the books, when they're giving these different gods and they have all the attributes and the numbers and everything that goes with the game, they had one very strange figure it was just made up. And this god was a god who was nailed to a wood panel. And of course, didn't have any attributes. No one was going to use this as their deity in this game because it just like this was pathetic. And then he leads his followers, because they always tell you about what these followers are for these different gods and goddesses. And of course, this one leads them to suffering. And I remember looking at this thinking, this has got to be a parody of Christianity. But the reason why I bring it up is not just simply to confess myself as being a nerd during high school, but it is to show you that from the world's point of view, it is exactly what St. Paul said 2,000 years ago. The cross is foolishness. That life should enter into this world in such a way, idiocy. That's why he says to the Jews, it's a scandal. God, the Messiah, is supposed to be this triumphant, glorious, majestic figure who descends from the heavens and beats everybody up and makes Israel number one on the earth. And of course, for the Greeks, always seeking wisdom, the good life, the way to live, honor, harmony, to live, you know, with proper discipline and balance. And then you say, well, life comes to you through crucifixion. That's why he said he's foolishness to the Greeks and a stumbling block, a scandal to the Jews. But it is a wonderful thing, St. Paul says, power and wisdom, divine, to those who are being saved. There's another part in his letter when he says, my gospel, this message is not difficult. And if they do not understand it, it's a sign of their perdition, they're being lost. So he uses the same thing for the cross, the gospel, the cross, the life, are all identical. So as I said, as you enter in and consider, start begin to wrap your head around the notion of the cross being a living, vital reality, not just something hanging on the wall, but something that embraces your life, transforms you, and draws you into the harmony to the return to paradise of its living reality. So that we can finish with the quotation from St. Paul in the epistle today, for the foolishness of God the stupidity of God, God's manifestation in this kind of ignorance. For the foolishness of God is wiser than the smarts of men, than the wisdom of men. And the weakness of God, being nailed to a board, crucified, that weakness is stronger than any human strength. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Now, please stand. Because we're not actually doing the adoration of coming forward and bowing and kissing the feet of the cross, the proper way to do it is as the cross goes through the procession, and this will be for everything, the Blessed Sacrament, the cross, whenever it's carried in procession, is we bow from the waist. In our places, as the cross goes by us, we make the profound adoration from our waist to do this act. But especially on today when we won't do the actual individual veneration and adoration of the cross. Today, more especially, again, to learn the Maronite gestures for this adoration from the waist. When the cross of Christ, of all cross of life, appeared, Constantine was filled with awe. He took heart and gained new strength and fought triumphantly. Now the faithful church, O Lord, looks upon your saving cross. May it be her strong defense in her fight with Satan's power. Or we'll recite verse 2, those who have the booklets, they're in your pews around. Choir, or we'll recite verse 2. The Lord's dead, your holy church comes. Doing well. Father, 
holy church and for every city and place throughout the world. With this water, spare us from the ravages of war and hunger, and from epidemics and from every human and natural disaster. Answer our petitions and have mercy on your people and save your inheritance. For you are gracious and a lover of all people. O Lord, I'll go unto you be glory, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the Creed on page 748. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate in the first day, and he came in. For our sake he was crucified on the conscious planet. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, and has so loved with the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic Church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the Lord to come. Amen. Almighty Lord in God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day. 
especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her cho the Chosen One, her spouse, Saints Mary and Saint Jude. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Continue with the anaphora of St. Mark the Evangelist on page 835. 835. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, Almighty Father, you are true in holy love. May we be bound by your divine love and join joy in it all the days of our lives. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with the holy kiss, that through Jesus Christ our Lord we may be your radiant and blameless flock. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to your holy altar of God. Peace. To the holy mysteries placed upon you, peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor, love and faith that are pleasing to God. before you and ask that you grant us in your mercy the riches of your grace and kindness. May your compassion and assistance sustain us all the days of our lives through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Holy God and Father, you sent your only Son to save us, for we are weak and poor. When we had gone astray, he brought us back to your spiritual fold by his royal blood. 
through your grace and the favor of your only Son, we implore you to accept this bloodless sacrifice from our sinful hands, and through it to forgive our sins. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. Truly glory, thanks, praise, and honor are yours, O God, the Father, maker of all creation. With your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit, the angels, archangels, and all the heavenly hosts bless and praise you. They cry out and they proclaim. Father Almighty, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, when we had strayed from you by transgressing your law, you sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. By your saving passion, he restored us to our original inheritance, and he gave us life by his divine blood. Wabiamo haudakum hasha di lema betraye, and sabe lachma bina kori shunto, o barahu kodesh, wakso ya bertolmita koromara, sabe hula mehne kulho, ho no denita, sahuro. Dachlof paikun, wachlof sagiem, metakaseo metihem, hosoyon, hame wa hoyen on alam alamin. Amin. Ho kanno alkoso damsik woman, hamro woman mayo. Barach o Kodesh, o Yabil Talmidao Karomara, Sabishtaw Mehne Kulho, Hono Denitao, Demoho Dila Diantiki Hadato, Dachlo Faikun Wachlov Sagie, et a shadow meti hem. Hussoyon, how may we hold on Alam Alamin? Whenever you observe these commandments, you proclaim my death and resurrection until I come again. Lord Jesus. 
Jesus Christ, you remember your plan of salvation for us, your conception, birth, and baptism, your saving passion and life-giving death, your burial, your glorious resurrection and ascension into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your royal second coming when you will judge all people and reward them according to their deeds. Now we ask you, at that fearful hour, have compassion on us and have mercy on us in your kindness and forgive our sins in your mercy. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them, and because of them, we praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you, and we ask you, have compassion on us, O God, have mercy on us, and hear us. Anin Mario, Anin Mario, Anin Mario, Anite Mor Rajo Kayo Kadisho, Wanahenda Lainu Aru Korbono, Ono. Since he may make this bread the body of Christ our God, Amen. and make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God, Amen. may these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the pardon of faults, the honor of building and strengthening of your holy church and for the protection of her children from all sin. And may these holy mysteries allow us to stand with confidence before your awesome throne, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, exalt your holy church established throughout the world. Protect your shepherds of the true faith in peace and security all the days of their lives, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops, the pious priests, the pure deacons, and all who serve your holy altar. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, all those who call upon your holy name. Bless those who are near and bring back those who are far. Visit the sick and strengthen the weak. Release captives and assist the oppressed. Bring back those who have strayed that they might live in your fear and reward those who have brought offerings to your holy church. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, our civil leaders and all the children of your holy church. Grant them security and peace, and keep domestic and foreign conflicts far from them, so that they may live in tranquility. Protect them by the sign of your living and victorious cross. Rescue the persecuted and the displaced of your flock, and be a refuge for strangers and a companion of travelers. Grant eternal, re re grant eternal reward to monks, to those who live solitary lives, and to hermits who live in the mountaintops and caves in the earth. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have Remember, O Lord, upon this altar and upon your heavenly altar, the holy and ever Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs and confessors, and evangelists, John the Baptist, the forerunner, Saint Stephen the Archdeacon, and first martyr, Saint Joseph, Saint Jude, Saint Marin, and all the saints. And we may we join their ranks and share in their joyful feasts. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. 
Remember, O Lord, the faithful teachers who have gone to their rest in the true faith, especially Peter and Paul, Mark, Clement, Ignatius, Dionysus, Julius, and all those who endured suffering and persecution for the strengthening of your holy church. Remember also those who serve your holy altar and forgive their sins, that they may reach your joyful dwellings. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, all those who have left this world and have gone to you. Lead them to your joyful dwellings and blot out all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. pleasing oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself for your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself as the Lamb. For your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you be glory forever. O God the Father, you are merciful and compassionate. You have sanctified the, this divine service and have perfected it in your good pleasure by the grace of your only Son and by the descent of the Holy Spirit. Sanctify us now that we may be renewed as your spiritual children so that with pure hearts and enlightened souls we may call upon you, O glorious Father, and lover of all people, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of thine. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation of soul and body, and crush our enemy, the evil one. Grant us your mercy through Christ Jesus our Lord, for you are blessed and glorified with him and with your Holy Spirit now and forever. Peace be with you. O Lord, look upon us, your inheritance who bow before you, and guide our steps on your right path. Make us worthy to share in this sacrifice, and may it sanctify the souls and bodies of those who receive it through Christ Jesus our Lord. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father.
one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory.
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. God the Father, how can we who are unworthy thank you for your grace? For you have given us this divine gift and have made us worthy to share in the body and blood of your only begotten Son who saved us. Through him and with him glory and honor are due to you and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, you are worshipped and you are holy. 
Bless and forgive the priests who are the stewards of your people and of your holy church. Forgive the servers of your divine mysteries and all the faithful who have shared in this sacrifice. Care for orphans, help widows, assist the poor and the distressed, satisfy the hungry, and protect all who call upon your holy name in every place. May your name be glorified with that of your Father and of your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.